Hey, what's up, man? How are you? I've got something from the boss. Okay. 1984, born in the USA, Bruce Springsteen tour jacket only given to tour crew. Okay. So where'd you get it? I bought it in a state sale in Chicago. Well, it's made in the USA. I hope so. <laughs> I want to sell the jacket today because I'm not really a huge Bruce Springsteen fan. I picked it up pretty cheap and uh, hoping to turn a quick profit on it. All right, that's pretty cool. Born in the USA, that was massively huge. I'll tell you that, it really was. Because every time you turned on the radio, that's what you heard. I know it's like one of the highest grossing singles of all time, but definitely one of the most misunderstood songs in American history. The song was about coming back from Vietnam and having a hard time, not about blind patriotism. <laughs> yeah, um, it was uh, about some tough times. Just like all of Bruce Springsteen's songs, depressing stuff. <laughs> Born to Run is not a depressing song. What, one out of a thousand that he wrote and sung about? <laughs> Born in the USA was a big turning point for Bruce Springsteen. This tour and this album is what guaranteed him a spot in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as one of the biggest rock stars in American history. This was a mega tour. He sold out stadiums all across the country and grossing over $80 million. In the early 80s, a bunch of my buddies went down to LA and saw him. But you know, unfortunately, because I had a one-year-old, I had to stay home. <laughs> it was all your fault that I could see Bruce Springsteen. Well, probably better for it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're looking to sell it? I am. What were you looking to get out of it? I'd like to get $500 for it. OK. Um... I mean, there's a lot of Jersey Shore Guidos that would love to have this, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, but let me have someone take a look at it. I've had really bad luck with tour jackets in the past. And uh, let me get his opinion whether this thing's going to sell or not. Absolutely. Okay. Totally right. fine. I'll be right back. All right, thanks. I'm excited about having an expert come in. I'd love to know all the details about it. Really beneficial, I think. So what's going on? What do we got? I know tour jackets don't usually sell well. But this is from The Boss, and I just want to get your quick opinion on it. Born in the USA, 1984. It tells you right there, June 1984. I was all of a year old then. I don't want to say how old I was, <laughs> but born in the USA was the biggest thing in the 80s. Right. I mean, it was huge, and so was Bruce. So this is his glory days. The thing about the Springsteen tour, it went through the end of 1985. It's like 155 dates on that tour. Could you imagine hearing were... Born in the USA 150 nights in a row? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Bruce Springsteen pretty much hit hard in 1975 with Born to Run. Nine years later, Born in the USA hit like nothing. It's the record of the 80s. It's all about the quality, for me, tells me how many they made. The band would buy custom ones for themselves, always with the embroidered name, and the record company would buy cheaper ones uh, because they bought lots. Okay. It's pretty much clean as you can expect for 1980s. Yeah. This is a quality, it's got some embroidery on it, it's an embroidered down patch. On the front, where you would embroider the name of the rock guy, it says CBS Records. This isn't a jacket that's meant for a band member to okay. wear and tour with. This would last three weeks. So it's sort of a promotional thing that the record company had and gave away. It's not that rare. OK. It would be more desirable to have one with one of the celebrities' names on. OK, or one of the crew, at least one of the real crew. I don't know. Do you want Bob? Yeah, you got a point. <laughs> you want Bruce? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so what do you think it's worth? I've seen this one recently. I've seen this one come up for sale. And um, it made uh, $700, okay. this one. But the difference was that one said Bruce on the front of it, okay. embroidered on. I think that a fair price on this at retail is 250 to three, 300. Okay. Thanks, man, I really appreciate it. Always my pleasure. Thank you. All right. I think in the shop here, it'd probably be a hard, hard to retail it out. It's not that exciting to most people. You'd have to be a Bruce Springsteen collector. All right. Um... Iconic tour. The tour of the 80s. I, I know that Warwick said it was worth a couple hundred bucks, but you know what? They're top sellers, and they take up a lot of space. Basically, man, to sell something like this, you need to get it framed and matted and everything like that. And then by the time you're done with that, you've 
got 400 bucks into it and it's worth 300 still. But you know what? I'm gonna pass on it, man. I wish I could do something with you, dude. I was hoping it was something just because it was, you know, Bruce Springsteen, but. Me too. Thanks, man. Thanks for coming in. Wish right. we could have done something. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. It, it was disappointing to hear that Rick didn't want to make an offer on the jacket, but I am glad that the jacket does have value. I'm confident we'll be able to get it sold. Hey, how you doing? Good, how you guys doing? I'm good. Hey, my name's Chum Lee. You can tell by the name tag on my hat. Oh, that's a very nice hat you have there. Thank you. It's not a name tag. What do you got here? I'm um, an actual tie and a couple of handkerchiefs from The Sopranos worn by uh, James Gandolfini. You know, I watched every single Sopranos except the last episode. Why not? Because uh, someone told me how it ended, so I didn't care. I have uh, James Gandolfini handkerchiefs, tie, and lighter, and they were used in The Sopranos. I got them from a former casino executive here in Las Vegas that did a uh, big favor for Gandolfini, and I acquired them years later. I'm hoping today to get $1,800 for the tie, handkerchief, and the lighter. Sopranos, probably top 10 TV series of all time. It's gotta be up there. It was a little weird to begin with when you first started watching that series, because like, you got like, whoa, 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 whoa. We got a mob boss seeing a shrink. I... But that's really hard to play off on a TV show is to have a bad guy that you like. Everyone fell in love with the series, and he did some movies after that. But unfortunately, James Gandolfini had a massive heart attack at 51, and just uh, the career ended really, really short. That was it. So we have a brony tie here. We have some handkerchiefs. Were these worn on the show? As far as I know, uh, yes. Um, we got a letter here, sir. James Gandolfini letterhead for the card. It says, thanks so much for all you did for us in Vegas. I would like to send you one of my Tony Soprano's Baroni ties. We have James Gandolfini's signature at the bottom of it. That's what I'm assuming it is. It's interesting. How much you want for him? I'm looking to get about 1800 OK. Let me call someone in and check out this. OK. OK? Yep. I mean, because this is the one thing that ties it all together. No pun intended. Let me have someone come in okay. and look at the note and look at the signature. If everything checks out, um, maybe we can do something. Okay. Sounds good. All right. I'm more than happy with an expert taking a look at these items. I believe that the handkerchief and the tie are truly authentic. Hey, Steve, what's up? What's up? You looking for a favor? Yes, need a favor, yeah. <laughs> what can I do for you? So we have this pretty cool tie to pocket squares and a note from James Gandolfini saying these were his. Oh, nice. I, one of the biggest icons of TV, when you say so? Tony Soprano? Yeah, I mean, and we have this pretty cool note here. I don't know, is his signature rare because he died suddenly? He did enough signings. He signed in person, and actually, he treated his fans pretty well. So, you know, people would wait for him on the set or, you know, in Hollywood and New York. They'd see him all the time, and he'd sign. So he's a pretty good signer. OK. And he's a pretty good guy, too. OK. Do your magic, dude. OK. So the first thing I want to do is just take a look at the ink that's on here. No doubt about that. You can see right in here, nice ballpoint pen, nice live ink in here. When I look at his signature, the James part was always usually pretty sloppy. You know, it's kind of the same thing here. So what do you think? You've got his letterhead. The signature is definitely his. This is a great piece. OK, so what's the note worth? Well, you know, the great thing about the note is that you've got all this writing from him. And that's something you just don't see a lot. I, I call that super rare. Most of the time, emails do, you know? Just the note itself, I'd say, is worth at least five or $600. Okay. Then you throw in the tie. I'm assuming the ties and the handkerchiefs are hits. Yeah, absolutely no doubt. I would really have a hard time believing it's not based on, you know, the provenance involved with it. I mean, he's directly referencing these items. So it's like, you know, I would say as a package, at least $1,000. OK. Now, what you could do, you could photo match this or go back through The Sopranos and try and find the episode where he did wear that. So that's just a little more investigative work, but I think it would be worth it, especially tying that all in together. That'd be a pretty neat piece to have. All right. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Good to see you. Nice to see you, Chum. All right. Good luck, man. Thank you so much. Take care. OK. What would be your best price on it? Um, well, I came in asking for 1800 I would like to go maybe $1,200. Uh, I'll tell you what. I'll give you 800 bucks. Uh. I am taking a gamble here. I have to get someone to find this in an episode in The Sopranos and get a screenshot. Right. I'll volunteer for that. I knew that was coming. Um, I'll give you 800 bucks. Man, uh, could you do like closer to 1,000? I'll tell you what, I'll give you 850. 
Yeah, I'll do A50. That works for me. All right, sweet. Um, I'll meet you right over there, and we'll do some paperwork. You want to write them up? I'll just start watching The Sopranos right now. You can write them up. He'll write you up right over there. I settled on A50. I'm just going to take it and reinvest it into maybe some other cool Hollywood props. Hey, how's it going? Good. How you doing? So what do we got here? Uh, the helmet of the greatest stuntman that ever lived, Evil Knievel. All right, give me a second. Uh, I'm going to grab the worst stuntman that ever lived. Pops, what's up? Evil Knievel helmet. OK, pretty cool. Evil Knievel just did some crazy stuff. I mean, one of his very first jumps, he was going to jump over so many cars, and at the end of the jump, there was a box of rattlesnakes. But he didn't make it all the way, and he landed on the box of rattlesnakes. <laughs> I'm at the pawn shop today to sell my iconic Evil Knievel helmet. It has evil emblazoned across the front and stars across the bar. I'd like to get $1,500 for the helmet. I think it's a very fair bargain for an iconic piece of memorabilia. If I make the sale today, I'm hoping to invest that money into an Evil Knievel cape or leather suit. This is definitely cool. I actually don't even really know what his first name was. They just started calling him Evil Knievel because he was just constantly evading the police, and the cops started calling him Evil Knievel. I mean, this guy didn't have a scared bone in his body, and if you told him he couldn't do something, he was going to show you he could. Yeah, I think throughout his career, he spent like a full three years in the hospital for motorcycle wrecks. Mm. In 1967, when he jumped the fountains at Caesar's Palace, you know, he jumped the fountains but crashed when he landed and spent 29 days in a coma. I mean, I just imagine later in life he probably had a lot of aching bones. So where'd you get this thing? I bought it from a dealer on the East Coast who bought it from a big Evil Knievel collector. All right, do you got any paperwork or anything with it? I don't, unfortunately. The big question, how much you want for this thing? 1500 OK. If this is actually one of his helmets, it would be worth a lot more than 1500 bucks and you have no paperwork with it. Correct. OK, so can I call somebody who will know for 100% sure if this is one of Evil Knievel's helmets? I'd love that. OK, give me a few minutes. I'll be right back. Thank you. I'm hoping the expert corroborates what I think, that it is a true piece that belonged to Evil Knievel. Clearly, you can see why we called you down. And to me, it's so hard to separate fact from fiction from Evil Knievel. You hear story after story, you're the guy that kind of clarifies some stuff for me. I'm Kelly Knievel, and my dad's Evil Knievel. I was a teenager when he was his famous Evil Knievel self, and my dad was one of the most famous people in the United States. Did he ever just intentionally know that he wasn't going to make a jump and crash? Intentionally? I'm, I'm <laughs> sure he's, like, gone over a jump and said, like, I really shouldn't be doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Well, I remember one time in Chicago when he jumped over the sharks. He knew he wasn't going to make the jump. So the night before, he said, look, you guys, you guys are going to have to film this, because I don't think I can make this jump tomorrow. So he did the jump, and sure enough, he crashed. So did he intentionally crash? No. Did he ever have a feeling that he may not make it? Yes. So do you mind taking a look at it for me? No, I, actually, I'd like to take a look at it. Now, will you tell me where you got this again? I bought it in an online auction from an individual who purchased it from somebody that had a huge Evil Knievel collection. And you paid how much for it? $1,500. $600. Correct. Um, it's got a sticker in there. I don't know if that's an original sticker or not, but. You see this Color Me Lucky here? It's all in black. Color Me Lucky is normally in colors. And this is a modern version of my dad on his motorcycle. So I would say it's pretty, but as far as it being an authentic Evil Knievel helmet, I say no. It'll look nice in the shop, though. OK. All right, have a good man. All right, thanks, guys. Nice to meet you, Nice Kelly. to meet you, too. Thank you. So here's the deal, man. You heard what Evil Knievel's son had to say about it. So I'll give you 300 bucks for it. I appreciate that, but I paid 600 and I was hoping for 1500 I thought that was a uh, fair price. OK, you, you paid 600 for a fake item, and then you're trying to sell a fake item for 1500 bucks. <laughs> I'm willing to get you out of this whole conundrum for $300, is what I'm offering you. He wants it for himself. Once again, 300 bucks. Well. I think my wife will be happy that I'm starting to get rid of stuff. So yes, we'll do it. All right, right over there, someone will write you up. Sounds great. You want that for yourself. Don't lie to me. I know I do. I'm just too cheap to pay for a real one. My gallery called me up and said I had to come down because there's a gentleman here 
with a leather jacket with a painting by Keith Haring on the back of it. Super popular pop artist from the 1980s. So I'm down here and I want to check it out. Hey, how's it going? Good, good to see you. So this is the jacket I got the call about? This is it. Um, it's Schatz Brothers leather jacket. It's got Keith Haring's famous three-eyed smile painted on the back by Keith Haring and signed by the artist in 1988. Did you wear it back in the day? I wore it quite often, and believe it or not, it used to fit me. You get lots of attention wearing that jacket. You should wear it. I'm telling you, it's a, it's a conversation piece. There's no way that would fit me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here today at Rick Harrison Collection to show Rick this great Keith Haring leather jacket that I have. I bought this jacket at auction, I think, about seven or eight years ago. I've got two daughters going through college. I thought maybe this is a good time to let it go. I'd like to get at least $15,000 for the jacket. Pretty cool. Keith Haring's a street artist in New York City, late 70s, early 80s, and he's really known for his stick figures. And he would paint on anything he could find to paint on. He painted on subway signs. He had a show in a parking lot once. He painted a mural on the Berlin Wall before it was torn down. Eventually, he started working with Basquiat. He ended up working with Warhol. Then after that, he was recognized as one of the street artists. It was extremely chic to have anything he did hanging on your wall in your house. To wear a leather jacket is even better, I guess, because now you get to bring Keith Haring art around to every club you go to in New York City. Do you mind if I look inside? No, no, sure. All the uh, Schatz Brothers labels are on there. OK. It's a vintage from the late 70s, early 80s. Just the fact that it's on a Schatz jacket makes it really cool. It's Keith Haring. If it can be verified to be legit, all of his stuff is worth a lot of money. How much do you want for it? Well, I'm thinking about 15000 OK. It's super cool. But, you know, it's herring, it's easy to fake. Oh, yeah. And uh, there's 100 fakes for every real one out there. Let me have my guy take a look at it. So let me give him a call, I'll be right back. All right. All right, cool. I'll be right here. I'm very confident that the Keith Herring jacket is authentic. If an appraiser came and said that it wasn't, I would be shocked. Keith Herring, art on the back of a Shots Perfecto leather jacket. Had to give you a call because I have no idea if it's real and I have no idea what it's worth. Ooh. Keith Haring made several of these jackets. Each one had a different design. The three-eyed face, the radiant baby, the barking dog. So this is, this is a real classic design. These designs actually had their foundation in his very early work when he would go into the subway. So in the subway is back in the late 70s, early 80s when an advertiser quit paying for the ad, they would put a big black sheet of paper up over it. So that's where Herring started doing these designs. He called them glyphs. So the subways, that's where most people became familiar with his art, and that would have been actually the origin of this particular design. So this is a very famous, very cool design. Where did you get this one? Uh, this one came from a, a major auction house, and they had it on consignment from the neighbor of Keith Herring's boyfriend, who when okay. Keith passed away, he gave it to him. He consigned it to the auction house. So it has provenance, it's been vetted. Full page in the catalog. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So what do you think it's worth? The other major gallery that has one is asking 50,000. So I think this is a very nice one and has his name, the date, I would say at auction, about 16,500. Well, thanks, man. Appreciate <laughs> thanks. It. Good luck. That's yeah, a cool thanks. jacket. Appreciate it. Right, bye. Okay. Um, Amy, Amy, what's your best price on it? I'm kind of firm at the 15. Give you 12 grand. I have two girls in college. It, it won't go a semester at the universities they're going to. Uh, 15 is it. Um, 12 grand, it's cash. I mean, you get cash. I just can't let it go for less than 15. I really appreciate it, though. OK. Change your mind, give me a call. All right. Thanks. How are we going? All right. I'm actually relieved that I didn't sell it. I, I had cold feet, and I, I really hated to see it go. And what is this, besides a picture of Lucille Ball? Well, I'm hoping it's a necklace that belonged to Lucille Ball. All right, this is cool. I like this. I mean, who doesn't like Lucy? I mean, I love Lucy. <laughs> I like watching I Love Lucy from the time I was a kid. Brings back a lot of memories. 
Along with the necklace, I have a picture of her actually wearing it, plus I have a certificate of authenticity. I'm hoping to get some pretty decent cash for this costume jewelry today. Lucy, I'm home. Lucille Ball, I mean, she started in movies in like the 30s, and then early 50s, she started I Love Lucy. It was just an amazing hit. This has been shown in just about every country in the world. I can't imagine how many languages it's been translated into. I can remember watching it in the 50s. In my neighborhood, there were probably only two TVs, one in our house and one down the street. And a little before me. Uh, yeah. Not before me. <laughs> oh, shut up. Everyone remembers Lucille Ball from I Love Lucy. But behind the scenes, she was a big Hollywood star with a lot of power. Her and Desi Arnaz not only produced I Love Lucy, but they also produced Star Trek and The Andy Griffith Show. It's sort of bizarre to think that without Lucy, there would be no Trekkies. <laughs> <laughs> Guarantees that the Fa double strand pearl necklace was owned and worn by Lucille Ball. This has got to be like the cheapest certificate of authenticity I've ever seen in my life. I mean, he literally printed this on his computer at home. At least he bought a foil and stuck on the end of it. <laughs> I believe it because there's enough here that tells me it's legit. Now, what do you want to do with it? I'd like to sell it. All right. Now, here's the big question. How much? Yeah, I was thinking maybe 500. Ouch. Um, give me 300 bucks for it. 300 bucks, that's more than fair. You go 350? I give you 3 and a quarter. I'm not going to go anymore. Well, that was going to be my next number, so it works for me. Okay, okay. right. All right, I'll meet you right up front. Okay. Keep an eye out, Pops. 325 was a little less than what I was hoping for, but I'm happy with it. That's okay. Now I've got the bug. Now I'll go back and start moving some other stuff and see if I can get rid of some other things. What's up, man? Not much. I have uh, John Wayne's hat from the man who shot Liberty Valance. This is John Wayne's hat? It's John Wayne's hat. From Liberty Valance? One of the most iconic movies, in my opinion. I mean, it had some stars in it, too. I mean, this was, this was full big-time stars. It was James Stewart, John Wayne, Lee Van Cleef, yep. Lee Marvin, those four together would kick the ass of anybody in Hollywood right now. <laughs> <laughs> I bought it from a big collector. He didn't want to sell the hat, but I brought out a briefcase full of money. I said, what's your crazy number on this? I had to have the hat. Hollywood just does not make movies like that anymore. Well, maybe Quentin Tarantino. Am I allowed to say that? All right, it's pretty damn interesting. It was, um, it was a cool movie. I mean, you're talking 1962, uh, Jimmy Stewart and John Wayne at this point, they're icons. They're in the top five, period. They're the Matt Damon and Leonardo DiCaprio of their day. <laughs> yeah. The greatest thing about this movie is the lines that came out of it. Exactly. When you think of John Wayne, what phrase do you think of, of him saying? It'd be Pilgrim, which is exactly. from Liberty Valance. Exactly. And he was wearing this hat in the scene where he first used that word. That is really, really cool. John Wayne has so much tough guy swagger that his movie lines are legendary. And think about it, it's been up to 70 years since some of his best films came out, and people still love him. So where exactly did you get it? This came from a guy named Nick Polidorus, who worked at Paramount Studios, and he was a friend of John Wayne's, and after the production of the film, he gave him the hat, so I have a notarized letter here and a statement from him. So did you buy it off this guy? No, I bought it off another collector who bought it off this guy. OK. I have some pictures here of him wearing it. And you can see the band and the cord and the creases. But the most important thing is that there's a scene where he shoots the paint cans and uh, Jimmy Stewart gets paint all over him and he punches John Wayne. And I think this is some of the paint splatter here. Okay. One other thing, it has a little tag in here saying John Wayne number two, and I believe he wore three different hats in the movie. All right. So how much do you want for it? $95,000. $95,000. I mean, it all looks fairly legit, man. You... I mean, it, 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 does, you, you, it looks good. The thing that's got me concerned, the movie was in black and white. 
It's hard to tell if the colors match. Color. Mm. Before I put that kind of money out, I want to be 100%. I want to be 200% sure. I just, that's just the way it is. I mean, it's a lot of money. Yeah. Do you mind if I ask someone to look at this? I mean, there's no one who knows more about John Wayne than this guy. Sure. I'm going to give him a call. I'll get him down here. He'll look at it. He'll know right away. OK. This hat is the one John Wayne wore in The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance. I have photographic evidence. And to me, photos just don't lie. That's John Wayne's son. That's John Wayne's son, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My buddy Ethan should be able to tell us if this is his dad's hat. Wow. That so, is cool. Is this your dad's hat? <laughs> Well, it looks like my dad's hat. Liberty Valance is a great movie. My dad was at the top of his game in that movie. I mean, he looked good physically. He owned that John Wayne thing that he had going on. Why can't you be somebody cool like John Wayne? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Corey. My dad's just a pawnbroker. <laughs> I'll tell you something about my dad. He always had fun. If my dad was with his friends and they were joking around, you know, he may throw out a line from a film like, whoa, there, Pilgrim, or, you know. It looks really good. It's got this ring around. It's got a really good matching hat band. And the color's good. And the shape is good. One of the things that I liked was that this was a hat that would have had a dent in it. And they made these creases. And in all the photos, you see the creases, the original crease, matches up. It still stays there. You can't get rid of that original hat maker's crease. And every photo, it's there. And of course, there's the scene where he shoots the paint can. I believe that's probably a paint stain. I remember seeing like a speck or two on the back, but I certainly don't remember something that big. But there could have been other takes as well, possibly. Yeah, and there's, you know, there's, there's multiple hats um, that it, it doesn't look the right size to me. It looks a little small. If he was wearing this hat, he would have had to really get it on there, and you see it's it's way down to his brow in that photograph. Mind if I put it on? OK. It should, you know, go down to my ears. Hey, Dudley oh. Do Right, how's it going? <laughs> That's a problem. I think he wore a 7 and 3 eighths. I'm about a 7 and a quarter. Hats typically don't shrink. But that's, that's awfully small. So that and the size of the brim is a bit questionable to me, and also that it looks so perfect. So there's a maybe. It's a maybe. So I, I can't definitively say yes or no to either one of you. I, I'm skeptical that I've just never heard of hats shrinking. They shrink. OK. Some of the ones in my archive certainly have. Thanks, Ethan. Did my best. Just because the hat is a little bit smaller than what John Wayne's actual size was does not mean it didn't shrink. That should not kill the authenticity of the hat. There's got to be a way to 100%, without a shadow of a doubt, prove it was his or it wasn't. Sure. But at 95 grand, we just can't pay it. OK. You know, there, I can't give you any type of big money, figure out a way to prove 100% that it's his, come back, I'd love to buy it off you. Oh, and you know I will. Okay. All right, man. <laughs> All right, thanks. Right. Appreciate it, buddy. All right. I'm going to have some photo analysis done on the hat and match it up forensically beyond a shadow of a doubt. Then I'm going to come back and show the guys and prove them wrong. Hey, how's it going? Pretty good. How about you? Doing all right. What do we got here? I got a replica of the Easy Rider helmet signed by Peter Fonda. All right, yeah, Captain America. Uh, arguably one of the most recognizable motorcycles in history. And this is the helmet. In 1969, they came out with the movie Easy Rider. The movie's good, but you know it was way before my time. Yeah. <laughs> I was in seventh grade. So. I'm here today to sell my Easy Rider helmet that's signed by Peter Fonda. I bought the helmet from a guy back in Illinois that ran a speed shop, and uh, he used to do road rallies with Peter Fonda back in the 70s, and he had him sign the helmet. The helmet's in pretty good shape for something from 1975. I've had the helmet for about 20 years, and it's a good conversation piece, but it didn't fit in with the collectibles that I have, so I decided to sell it. This is cool. Easy Rider. It's the quintessential 60s movie. Easy Rider was about two drug dealers on motorcycles trying to move drugs from LA to New Orleans and kind of getting in little adventures along the way. 
I mean, you have Peter Fonda, Dennis Hopper, Jack Nicholson. The movie came out in 1969. I mean, there wasn't a lot of high hopes for it, but $350,000 movie turned into 30 million. It was a huge success. So you already said it was a replica helmet, right? Um, yeah, it's a replica, I mean. Yeah. But it's pretty close to the time period. Yep, Peter Fonda signed it, I guess. The condition, you can tell it's been dropped. It's been banged around a little bit. Um, it's not cracked, so you can still use it, I guess. I didn't even clean it up. I didn't want to mess with the signature, so. Uh, good idea. <laughs> what are you looking to do with it? I'd like to sell it. Any idea of what you're looking to get? Oh, about 1500 more. OK. Um, I really have no idea what Peter Fonda's signature is going for these days. Um, have you ever had the signature looked at? Do you got any paperwork or nah, anything? I just bought it and took the guy's word for it. All right. Uh, do you mind if I have a buddy of mine come down and do it? No, that'd be great. OK. Um, well, I'll tell you what. Hang out. Let me give him a call and see if I can get him down here, OK? OK. I'm glad to have an expert come in, because I, I'd like to know for sure that the, it's a good signature, but uh, I'm just taking the guy's word for it. What's happening? Replica Captain America helmet with Peter Fonda's signature. Nice. Easy Rider. It's really one of the best movies of the late 60s. You had Dennis Hopper to direct it, Jack Nicholson, and Peter Fonda. You can't really go wrong with that cast. Pretty cool movie. So what are your concerns? Uh, well, I know the helmet's not the original one. I don't know anything about Peter Fonda's signature, though. OK. Um, usually, Peter Fonda was a good signer for people throughout his whole life. I've got some pretty good illustrations to show you his, his signature throughout the years. So he had kind of a sloppy signature. It wasn't much to it, but it stayed the same from the 60s pretty much all the way up until he died. Corey, if you don't mind, if you could hold that for me. I'm going to show you a series of checks. This is from 68, 1972, 1978, and then 1988. Now, the thing you see here, and I'll go back to this one, is the straight up consistency. Now, when I see this, I'm seeing something totally different. So it lacks kind of what he does here um, almost 100%. The last name is almost completely different and spurious from what he would sign. Uh, the, the F, I'm not even sure what's going on here. It's an uppercase F. He uses kind of a lowercase, almost looks like a J to sign. So I'm seeing a lot of things that don't match up to me here, Corey. Well, I found a couple on the internet that were early signatures that matched that completely. I've seen probably five, 600 myself in my career to authenticate. So, you know, Corey, you know, based on what I see here, there's not the same thing. Oh, I got to go with you, man. Appreciate it. All right, dude. Good to see you. Well, good luck. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Happens sometimes. Huh? Yeah. I had no reason to doubt the guy, but I wasn't there to watch him sign it. So well, it is what it is. Last words of the movie, man. Yeah. We lost. Yep. Take okay. care. Thanks. He's an expert. That's what he does for a living. I don't know why he would lie to me. It'll just go back on the shelf, and now it's just a conversation piece. <laughs>